All right, we are going to start. We appreciate everybody being here and making it today. You guys can move that pillar right there out of your way if you want. I need to adjust this camera just a little bit. I don't like it when it cuts. I didn't pay attention to camera one time and it would cut the whole top of my head off. <laughs> so, don't like that look. Hey, Paul, remind me, I want you to tell me about that art place you went to or something that you posted on Facebook. That looked interesting. All right, well, it's good to see everybody here and everybody with us on Facebook. Uh, we enjoyed our holiday two weeks and I hope you did too. I just felt like I'd take those two weeks off and do some studying and do some fun with my friends and parties and gain weight and all the stuff that you do during the holidays and then we're going to go out to a nice place today so I might gain some more weight so whatever it'll come off amen, amen. so I hope you've been enjoying these studies I was counting them yesterday we when I finished uh, no penal substitution I think that was what I was the last series I taught uh, I uh, I just sat and waited for the Lord to really show me what to do. And I kept hearing spiritual code and symbolism of the living word. And so we did that for quite a while. I, uh, I did uh, quite a few lessons and I was teaching on Jesus's words and a lot of things out of the gospels and some of Paul's writings or whatever. And so uh, after a while, then I started, uh, I, I decided I was going to teach out of my translation on the book of Romans and actually teach from that. So this is our 93rd lesson in this series and this 28th lesson in Romans. So we've done a lot. You know, it's, it's really amazing what you can do when you stick at it and you just keep going. And out of that has come a lot of books. So I have quite a few books available and a lot of people have been writing me about them and ordering them. And so I appreciate that very much. <clears throat> So I was going to skip reading this, but I don't want to. I think it's important to read the scripture. You know, it, it, when I read the scripture, it takes up my teaching time. <laughs> I think Jesus felt that way. He was the scripture, though. You know, he, he had it. It just flowed out of him. And it flows out of us, too, today. But, but it's important for us to read these. And I want you to see something in this today, because after I read these, le these verses, all I could think of was Paul was talking about Moses, and he was explaining Moses. So that's going to be the topic of my teaching today is on Moses, and we need to understand Moses. How many have ever heard Moses taught before? All of you have, haven't you? Have you been in church? You know, you've got the surface level of the word. Everybody knows who Moses is. I think almost every religion in the world knows who Moses is and what Moses did and of course, most people were taught that Moses did what God told him to do. Now that we know what we know, do you believe that? Not at all. And the truth is, most people don't do what Father tells them to do. How about that? The truth is, many of us could actually say there's times in our life that we heard Father say something, but we made it fit what we wanted or we just didn't want to do it at all. Or we said, OK, I'm going to do that. And it, we did it one or two times and and then we changed. And so I put a post up not too long ago about the word Shama, what it means in the Bible. And it doesn't mean obey. It means to listen with with attentively, to listen with intelligence. And a lot of people got mad about that. Not a lot. Excuse me. <laughs> a couple. A couple of people got mad because they want obey to be there. Because they, it, it, without the word obey, then they can't control people, right? But if they really tell, the, speak the truth of themselves, they haven't always obeyed the word too. And if you're going to obey the law, what part of the law do you have to obey? Every bit of it. Everything. You can't just pick a few pieces you like or whatever. So I was accused of changing the Bible to fit my, what I believe, and I don't do that. I fit it to believe what I know. And what I hear the Father say to me and what the words really say. And again, I will remind people who are listening to me, when you translate scripture in the interlinears, you don't pay attention to what the author wrote their opinion is. You just pay attention to what the word meant. Because if you don't, then they're just going to say like where it talks about traduce or hinder, then he says Satan, the arch enemy of God. Well, that's not what the word means. It means traduce or hinder. And we all can introduce people, can't we? Mm -hmm. And who, you know who we've introduced the most? Ourselves, right? We're our own worst enemy in most cases. So uh, let's get 
past that and go on. So I'm going to, talk, going to talk about the allegorical understanding of Moses today. And we're going to read from Romans 7, verse 12 through 25. I've posted on Facebook where people can print it out and read it themselves. But <clears throat> it says here, Moses had pure intentions. And I believe that. I don't believe really any preacher today gets up and preaches something that they, they just know it's not true. And I don't believe they're out there doing it. I believe systems do. I believe they, the, the, the people that are in charge of a lot of the systems know it. But as far as the preachers and the ministers and just the ordinary people, I don't think they really, they have pure intentions. They love people and they want people to get saved and they want people to get filled with the Holy Ghost and, and all that stuff. And it's special to them. And they just don't know that a lot of it is untruths. And so Moses had pure intentions, and his purpose was pure when he devised the commandments of the law. He functioned out of his awareness, which was polluted by his upbringing. So did we. He dealt with the people who were not living out of their holy breath. Therefore, Moses took it upon himself to give them guidelines to live by, which he thought would appease Father. And then he said, these guidelines came from Father. Now, I added that part to my translation because that's what he did. So verse 13, however, when I sought, this is Paul talking, however, when I sought to follow the dictates of Moses' law to bring good in my life and to produce holiness, all it did was create death for me. Now, death with father is no understanding of father. That's what it is. So following the dictates of the law for righteousness, hoping it might reveal any mark missing or sin in me as though the law is good to me, is deadly since all it does is produce more and more dead works. Verse 14, we understand Moses' intended purpose. He wanted the law to be a spiritual thing. However, it existed as a carnal tool to obtain righteousness. We lived in servitude to the continual bloody sacrifices of dead animals and other dead works we thought our father required to be appeased, and father never needed or required that. Doesn't this sound more like what Paul would have said instead of what King James Version said? So verse 15, so when I try to follow the do-to-be laws, and I get that from Dudley Hall, a great Baptist teacher that taught grace works. He used that phrase, do-to-be. So when I try to follow the do-to-be laws, those supposed righteous acts of law, which I seek to do, I cannot perform. How many of you have been there before? Always trying to be better. Always trying to give enough. Always trying to serve enough. It, and it's just you couldn't do it. And it left you feeling condemned. It left you feeling naked, if you would. So I already aim at, uh, aim, excuse me, I already am who I try to become through these futile efforts of obeying the law. I'm still working to be, though. I'm already, I already am that, but I'm still working to be because I don't know for sure that I really am. So I'm, verse 16, I'm still consciously following the dictates of the law, trying to be right wise and all my doings. And I consent to by the actions that I believe doing work is the way to be righteous, but it is not. I know that being law minded does not originate from my holy breath awareness. It become, it comes from sin consciousness. This sin consciousness causes one to continually live, continually live in a carnally infected state and it seeks mastership over us. Verse 17. Now that I know the truth, I find it is not the real me. It is not my voice of spirit that tries to accomplish righteousness by obedience to the law. It is that false feeling of not being right with Father, which is the lie that remind, remained in my conscious awareness. And family, even... In, in 1996, when I met Brother Garner and I began to hear some, some real truth and real understanding, and it's, it was penal substitution, but it let me know that I was righteous and I was holy already, I still had this in my conscious awareness, and I still struggled with not being right with God. I just, it, there, it, if I, I could solve one problem, then another problem popped up or whatever. So I can relate to what Paul's saying here. Paul knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Verse 18, I know that any inclination to follow the dictates of the law is the part of me that hinders me. That's my devil, if you want a devil. That's what the word devil means, hinder, introduce. So it, that hinders. It does not produce any good thing. The ability and will to live as holy breath is a power within me, but since I was living essential and by the law, I could not follow through with my good intentions. Verse 19, the, and this whole thing could preach right here for an hour if we wanted to. <laughs> but 
But the source of any good works I did, when done based on efforts to obey the law to be righteous, produced nothing good. It always failed. The repetitive, worthless acts I performed to produce righteousness, which I continued to do, remained driven by my strong sense of worthlessness, resulting from my failure to succeed to the due to be laws. It was insanity. Verse 20, if I do these things that I do not represent my true nature and character, it is not my true self that does them. It is a strong memory of a lifetime of sin consciousness and repetitive worthless acts, which are the dictates of the law and continue to dwell in my conscious awareness. And I'm thinking this right now. You know, when Paul went out, persecuted the Christians and all the stuff that he did, when preachers are up there being mean to the congregation, beating them, you know what they're doing? They're, they're, they're using them to beat themselves up. They're doing what they would do to themselves. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm articulating that properly, but that's what they do. They're, they're, they're working their anger out upon them. Okay? And that's what, uh, to me, that's what I see Paul saying here. So these dictates of the law are anti or against holy, holy breath. And we hear about antichrist coming, right? Well, Christ meaning contact. So Jesus said, anti-contact has always been among you. There's all kinds of stuff that's kept you from contacting Father. Yes. Does that make sense to you, Lily? Yes. That's the anti. It's not Christ. The word, it's really, it's contact. You can say Christ if you want the Christ mind or whatever. But it's really important to understand that all the law does, it keeps you from contacting Father. Yes. Because you're ashamed and you don't even want to see God. Definitely, you don't want to walk into a room with God. Right? right? So it's against your holy breath. And he said, my holy breath is supplying all that is eternally mine right now. Verse 21, I have become fully aware that the acts of following the law uh, to do good and the worthless efforts of achieving these things I already possess, which is my right standing with Father. It continues to try to prevail in me. But, verse 22, since the voice of the holy breath Father has revealed what is mine. I am well satisfied with the law of the spirit of life. The law is the life that was given to me by Father. The same is the holy breath man that I exist. <clears throat> In verse 23, I must pay close attention. We must pay attention. We must be alert, though, because there continues to be part of the Mosaic law that often hounds me in my conscious awareness. Due to my lifetime habit of seeking to follow it, the great lie of believing I had to do the works of the law to be righteous aims to resist the law of the spirit of life in my divine mind, which is my holy breath. If I allow it, the lie I believed for a long time seeks to bring me back into its captivity. It makes me feel I must do the law of sacrifice to make me feel better about my side slips. And family, more than half of my life, I was under the law. You don't think my subconscious is full of that? It doesn't have as much as it used to, but like Paul, if I don't pay attention, sometimes it creaks back in. You know, and not just with me, but me, me dealing with people and how I look at people. So, uh, verse 24, I ask this question for all people. How long do we have to bear this horrible weight of trying to earn our righteousness by doing these many do-to-be laws? Who shall deliver us from the slavery, slavery that produces death and intimacy with Father and the end in our bodies? The answer is, verse 25, through the divine inspiration of our holy breath and Jesus, the great master, comforter, messenger, who, who among us possess a supreme authority on the subject, revealed it to us in his teachings and what he did. He let us know that we are right wise with Father. By hearing with intelligence the voice of my holy breath, I know we are we were and are eternally right wise with our Father, which is the not concealing truth that makes us free from serving with continual sacrifices and the law of sin and death. Amen. Amen. Wouldn't that make a great track? Mm -hmm. Anybody want to do that? They're more than welcome to. This this to me, this is something that needs to be printed out and given to your friends that are struggling and sit down and read it to them. Don't just say, here, go read this, but read it to them. So I, I think it would bless people tremendously. <clears throat> so in this section of Paul's letters, we find Paul telling his Roman followers that Moses' attention, again, was pure and was honorable. However, Moses did not <coughs> attentively listen to Father. 
And the majority of the things that Moses said God said to do, that is not true. And we think about this. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Pentateuch. That's a lot of writing. <laughs> he didn't have a computer. <laughs> he didn't have pen and paper like we have. I, maybe later on they did. I don't know. You study pens. You can tell me if they did or not. But I'm just saying he did a lot of writing on God's behalf. And most of it was blaming Father for all the bad stuff murdering people, killing children, circumcision of men, which was butchery and all this stuff. And so, so Moses did many things and gave laws and rules that were not from father. And during the journey of the children of Israel and also some Egyptians were with them, Moses would often become very angry and did things not directed by father. Right? Yes. I know a few preachers have become kind of angry and did things and said things. As a pastor, there were some times I'd get a little upset with the congregation. And so I would go study a, ver a scripture about being more faithful or study, and I'd get up and teach on tithing. And I mean, it's the same thing, isn't it? And maybe God did not tell me I'm supposed to be preaching the beautiful good news, but yet I'm trying to get the people to line up with what, oh, it's God that wants them to do it, but I want them to do it, right? So he became angry. So Moses was Aaron's brother. He was one of the high priests of what is commonly called the Jewish religions, Aaron's brother. And Aaron was to be a light bearer. When you look up his name, actually it means light bearer. Aaron's name means uh, illumined, enlightener, and mountain air are very, very lofty. So Aaron was to serve with this executive power out of the divine life of God. And Moses was to help him and to lead him to that. And sadly, he failed to do that in many areas. So Aaron was with Moses to help Moses as a bearer of spiritual light and to strengthen him because Moses was very insecure about himself. I mean, he told Father, I can't talk or whatever. So, you know, it, Father said, I'll speak through you, is what he said. But he said, oh, but I can't talk. And so Father sent him Aaron to help him. But <clears throat> so Moses was fearful already. And be, fear causes you to go the wrong direction. Fear causes you to not hear the voice of Father properly because your fear is overwhelming you. And yet scripture says that God is not the author of fear. Amen. And so what we see and what we dwell on and what we think about, it really affects us. Donna was watching a news show the other day and it was about a horrible thing that happened to somebody. And uh, next thing you know, for two nights, she's dreaming terrible dreams. It's just a sample of how much more have we brought into ourselves, and in this world that tries to bring fear and then we're not able to function out of who father tells us to uh, what father tells us to do <clears throat> so we see that in his making of this molten calf aaron aaron molding this false god symbolizes this erroneous state of thought because thought can become an idol what you believe becomes an idol I put a small post not too long ago or last week about that we're not humans. We're not mere humans. We're, we're supernatural. Uh, one of the words for, again, for devil and my friends that think I preach on devil too much, I don't. But these meanings are important. I don't preach on devil. I preach on supernatural spirits. I preach on what traduces and hinders us. So the one that's Damion, uh, no, Dubalos. Dubalos means a supernatural spirit of a bad character. And of course, if you grow up in church, you think that's a devil, right? But it wasn't. It's us. We're spirit and we're supernatural. That means other than physical. That's what super means there. Other than physical, we are spiritual beings. Every time Jesus dealt with somebody that was sick or paralyzed, vexed of a, of a devil, actually it said vexed of a bad character. Everybody that was physically ill, they, they, that was the word he used. Or that, that they, so they were sp supernatural but they had a bad character that produced sickness and disease or whatever. And so what happened here is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, these states 
uh, and these thoughts and this sense knowledge begins to build up in a person and it begins to build up in a person's consciousness and then it affects them and it becomes their driving force, if you would, and it even becomes their source. Dr. Phil, that psychologist from Oklahoma, he said this years ago, but he said, if you're doing something that's out of your character, you must be getting something out of it or you wouldn't keep doing it, right? Because it's bad. So they begin to function in sense knowledge and when they perfected the truth, but they don't carry the spiritual idea, it, they, they let go of their thoughts and their thought realm lures down into a lower plane of consciousness. And that's what we call carnally mindful. And let me get a drink of this hot water. I feel like you can't hear me. It's probably the way I hear myself. <clears throat> So we have stories in the Bible about the Philistines and their, the word Philistine means dust dweller, you know. So Father made man out of the dust of the earth, but then he breathed the breath of life in them and made them what? Life giving spirits. We were no longer to be dwelling out of the dust. And in a sense, Father brought man up to a higher awareness of who he was. And so this is what happened with this idol. They begin to be dust dwellers again, and their awareness begin to lower down and go back to Egypt. Because what did Egypt do? Where did they get the ideas of this golden calf in Egypt? Because they were raised there, and particularly Moses was raised there. So during my studies of uh, Moses, I found a name of a range of mountains in, in the, uh, the uh, country of Moab, I need to fix that there. A Moab and the mountain range was called A-B-A-R-I-M, Abarium, and it means regions beyond, it means passages, it means fords, and it means crossings. So Moses was shown this land of Canaan from the top of that mountain peak. And what happened there, it was there that they said Moses died. Because Moses, it pictures the law, and so it was the end of the law, and they were heading to the promised land, and God took him up and killed him. Well, is there any death in Father? Does Father cause anyone to die? No. What people think they do. It's appointed once for man to die, then the judgment, and that's not what that means. But they, they, we go to funerals all over the world, and they get up and say, we don't know why God took your loved one, but... You know, and then they try to preach the sovereignty of God and God can do what he wants. But there is no death in Father. There's nothing but life. Father is life. Father is spirit. So personally, I don't see that Moses died. I can't prove it to you. But the thing is, they can't prove that he died either. They said he died. But in Deuteronomy 34, 6, it starts out with a statement. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab. But no man knoweth his sepulcher unto this day. How do they know he buried him there? Huh? Just because he went up there and didn't come back doesn't mean he's dead. <laughs> right? So, you know, I'm not going to preach that a lot, but people who saw him leave made that assumption. Just like people in the Bible, you find all kinds of places where they said they heard a voice from heaven. Well, those people were not aware that God spoke to them in their thoughts, Right? So if somebody speaks to you in your thoughts, you know, have you ever heard a voice and you turned around to see it? It wasn't there. What was it? John was in the spirit on the Lord's day and he was at the table of showbread and he was feeding on a revelation and it, it caused him to raise up in his awareness and he heard a voice behind him and he turned around. Well, it was in his thoughts. And so all these things where God spoke from heaven, it was right here in the thoughts, and God speaks to people right there. So I'm just saying, if you want to believe God killed him and took him up there, that's fine, but I don't believe that. So uh, he transformed. He transformed into the cool of the day. He stepped out because he showed up where else? On the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah both transformed, transfigured, whatever you want to call it. And they, they entered, they left the realm of time. That's what they did. But they were still right there. So Moses' understanding be, was merged into the I exist. Father awakened him, fully awakened him, and he woke up and he understood everything. 
And so therefore this range of mountains uh, express the divine, the divine law of life is what it represents. He came up higher, if you would. That's what it would represent to us. And therefore the range do, uh, known as Abraham brings us a spiritual thought that cause us to look away from error. And that's what we're all going through and have been for a long time, particularly the four of us for many, and Norma, for many years, we have been brought up to this high range and y'all are being brought up to it. And, and it's causing us to look away from that error. We can't go back to it. No. Now, a lot of people have come and tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and they're happy with the fact that the Lord is good. And they're happy with the fact that, oh, well, <clears throat> when I die, I'll be with the Lord. But they want to go back, and they want to continue where they were. And as sadly, the Bible says it's impossible to renew them to come back to hear the truth, because they're happy with one thing, and that's all they wanted. But we, we don't want that. I want the whole enchilada. Mm -hmm. I, I want all of it. So we've been, we've been brought up like Moses to a spiritual elevation of great understanding. So there's a city, and I posted this on Facebook, uh, on O-N. I don't know if it's pronounced that way in the Hebrew, but it's O-N. And it's a city where Moses was trained in after he was taken out of the, the uh, Nile River. They put him in a, a little ark, which was a, I don't know what you call it, a weave basket, if you would. And they took him out, and uh, Pharaoh's wife got him and raised him. And then he was raised in this place, and it's the oldest known city in the world today. It's still there. <clears throat> it was called uh, H-E-L-I-O-P-O-L-I-S, Helopolis, or something like that, and Beth Shizma. And it was devoted to this uh, monotheistic worship of God symbolized by the sun. And they worshiped the sun, the, not the sun Jesus, not a sun Jesus, but they worshiped the sun. And, and it had sanctuaries, and Moses was educated there uh, as the foster son of Pharaoh's daughter, as a prince. I said wife, but the daughter. And I found that Homer and Plato and Pliny and many other uh, sag sagas of the Western world went there to study philosophy, and they learned the education of the world. So Moses was a very educated person in the ways of the world. And if you studied very much about Egypt, they had all kinds of gods. They had cats, they had every kind of animal there was, you name it. And if they needed another one, they came up with another one. And they offered all kinds of things to them. What'd you say? Birds, everything. So allegorically, in its purity, on refers to spirit breath and spiritual understanding and substance of power because they had a lot of understanding a lot of science. So as it appears in our Bible, it's an, uh, the outward symbol of the sun is worship. That's what's happening in the world today. Many people are worshiping the creation and not the creator, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it goes on constantly. And they also worship the messenger mm -hmm. instead of the creator. Mm -hmm. And I know that's hard for people, but who was the greatest messenger there ever was? Jesus. And then Paul was an awesome messenger, and John was an awesome messenger. And there's a guy named Roy that's a really good messenger. <laughs> and nobody has worshipped him one time. <laughs> I've tried to get him to kiss my ring I used to wear. And <laughs> they wouldn't do it. So it was a surface level worship. It was things, and because they could not or would not know God. They would not follow God. They would not go within. And that's what we're doing today is we're going within. And we're, like Paul said, don't be conformed to this old worn out way of living, this old world system, but be transformed by the renewing mind. Not the renewing of. Take that word out of there. It wasn't there because that makes it a work of effort. That means I had to study and I had to do this and I had to renew. No, the renewing mind is the divine mind. Listen to the Father. If you listen to the Father, you'll be transformed. Because the greatest thing you can hear from the Father is, I have always loved you and I always will love you. Have you ever heard that? Yes, the love of God is powerful. 
<clears throat> so we must stop studying scripture on a surface level. And that's what's wrong is the messengers that are here today are doing their best to teach truth. But there's so many out there that are an enemy to that. And they want to say, oh, no, that word means that word. And that's what it means. And the other translations say this. And my, my interleaners say this and that. Well, I'm sorry you believe that. But, but it's just man's understanding. All the Strong's Concordances today, all the new ones, they don't show the added words. They don't show the words that are twisted around. You can't get those anymore and, and discover them. You've got to have an older interlinear Strong's Concordance. And again, don't pay attention to what he says after that. If it doesn't show the 999 numbers, then they've changed it. Yeah. You know. And, and there are many other ways. So that's why we study, and that's why we teach allegorical, spiritual, parabolical, metaphorical, metaphysical, and all these other symbols in the scripture to show us the truth. And I'll never forget my brother, Tom Willis. He's passed away now, and I called him before he died, way before he died, and apologized to him for stopping him from preaching because he was using a metaphysical dictionary. My pastor told me that was dangerous, and don't let him preach anymore. Well, guess what? I study it now. I don't use it all because some of it's wrong, but a lot of it is right. And I can discern what's wrong and what's right now. And so we've got to do that. So Moses' name means drawing out. It means extracting. And it means drawing from the water or water saved. That's the meanings of his name. So he was the son of Amram, of Jochebed, and the brother of Aaron and Miriam. And allegorically, the birth of Moses represents man's development into a conscious spiritual law. Moses was being brought out. Where was he at? Well, you know, Father told him he was going to, uh, to cause him to, to free the children of Israel. Instead of waiting on Father, what did he do? He started on his own, and he went and he killed somebody. And then he went out in the desert, and he was upset and mad with himself, and he was afraid. And so, but Father was bringing him up to higher and higher. His desire was to bring him up to spiritual awareness. And I believe he had some spiritual understanding, but I believe the carnal understanding was overshadowing that. And it kept dragging him back down. So, <clears throat> our development must come under the law of life. And as Kay teaches, she talks about the right side brain, the left side brain, the, the mind brain connection. And it's a powerful teaching. And uh, I'm not going to ever teach it, I don't think, because she's got plenty of it out there. But the truth is that we have to have the Father, allow the Father to draw our awareness and draw our thinking, which is on the left side, which is more carnal, more mechanical, I guess you would say, and into those things, into the right side, which is spiritual and artistic and beautiful, and it represents the mind of God. And so Moses started out uh, of what many would call a negative situation by being placed in the water, but then he brought he was brought into Pharaoh's house, which many would have called a really good situation, but it wasn't. It brought him to a false awareness. So when we're in what seems to be Egyptian darkness, and we're weak in understanding, we're right for higher understanding. When we realize that the light that we have is not light, but darkness, and we know it, that's when we can say, Father, here I am, teach me, I'm ready. Because everybody has to get to this place where they realize and come to the conclusion that almost everything they believed is not working, and if it's not working, it must not be true. That's hard, isn't it? But think about it. I was told if I give my tithe, I would be blessed and I would never lack anything. But the very fact that I gave it to get that tells me that I thought I had a need. Mm -hmm. And that was anti-contact with Father. That was anti that I have all things that pertain to life and godliness right now. So everything we were told to do in our upbringing and, and just the very fact that they tell you to do it means you don't have it. What did you have to do to get saved? You had to say a sinner's prayer, right? And that's nowhere in the Bible whatsoever at all. They just made it up, but we believed it. We were told we had to be baptized in water to be, that some churches say to be saved. Is that true? No. Well, you think that's true? No, not at all. Not at all. And then we were told we had to, some churches said we had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues or we weren't saved. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. So we can come to this place 
where darkness, which means lack of understanding, means we're ripe for more because then all of a sudden we realize, you know what, I don't know it all. It's not working in my life. And we've got to get out of this pan theology. It's going to pan out. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to live the best life I can. Well, what if there's somebody that in the world that only you are able to touch? They're waiting for you to wake up. It could be your kids. It could be your grandkids. Billy Graham, the very first revival he had, one person showed up. He had a tent revival. Excuse me. One person came to the altar. He had a tent revival. And a little bitty boy came down and gave his life to the Lord. And that was Billy Graham. Whether Billy ever taught the correct message, he had one powerful ministry. And he loved people. And I think more than getting people saved, he showed people the love of God. But what if that guy just felt like a failure and just quit? Bill, that probably never would have happened. And so there's people in our world that are waiting for us to wake up. And it's time to lay down everything you thought was true and quit fighting for it because you know it's not working for you. You've got friends like that, Norma. She knows it's not working, but she still fights for it. I don't understand that. And there are millions of people just like that. So the thoughts that rule in darkness are bent upon putting all the children of light and out of the house of faith. And so Moses' parents, uh, there was this desire for him to be protected. They didn't know where they were sending him, but they knew they were to put him in that ark, and they knew he was going to be protected, and he was protected, and he was brought out, and he was brought to a wonderful place, but he just still continued to not listen. So if you don't succeed in your ministry, which you want to, but if you don't, there's going to be somebody else that's going to take up and just going to continue on and continue on because God's going to get what God wants. And that's God wanting the people to know him in spirit and to know him in truth. And I believe we're going to see more and more of that. So we must care for the early thought of truth and surround it with love. We must care for the true messengers within us we must care for the true messengers that are ministering to us, right? And in the midst of seeming, seem, uh, seeming enemy of wrong thoughts and beliefs, we can begin to realize that there's more and more and more, and we lay that down and we stop letting it rob us. Because everything other than the truth is a robber. Didn't Jesus say the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy? And we were taught that that's the devil. Well, the thief was the lie. A lie is a thief. The things that was said about me in my younger years, that's a thief. I had a minister tell me that, uh, told the staff that, that Roy is, uh, well, he just told a bunch of stuff that was not true. But if I would uh, identify with that, that would have really robbed me. But it robbed me from a relationship with those people because a lie was told about me. So Moses symbolizes this progressive or drawing out process, which works from the right brain, which is spiritual understanding, uh, and it, it draws us upward out of the left brain, which is carnal understanding. So that's what we do here. We don't try to get you saved. We're trying to bring you up higher in your understanding. So involvement, involvement always precedes evolution. Does that make sense to anybody? Evolution is growing, right? So if you're not involved in the truth, then you won't have any evolving whatsoever. So we must get involved in what's going on. We must get involved in what Father wants for us to do today. I'm not saying be faithful and come to church more or whatever, but in your personal life, you need to be feeding. You need to be studying. You need to find somebody that's teaching truth and meditate on what they're teaching. And it's, you, you know, the only body I know is me and Kay that's really teaching what we're teaching. Don Keithley's teaching some great truths. There's some other people that are out there, but Kay and I have all of our books. We put everything out there. I send free PDF files. I send free books. Not too long ago, I sent all my books to a gentleman because I want people to hear the truth. I don't do it for the money. I don't, but you have to have money. (laughs) You know, computers and all the stuff that you do and the internet, people have no idea what it costs to run just a little ministry right here. Just what I do in that office back there. But, but we, we want people to hear the truth. I would, I would stand on the street corner and pass books out of people, but just read them. <laughs> oh, 
and this, this person I sent my books to, I said, I'm going to send these to you, but I want you to underline things that you have questions on and then call me and let's discuss it. I love to do that. I enjoy doing that. So involvement's important to us. So in Joseph down in Egypt, in Genesis 37, 28, I'm not going to read it, but we have portrayed this involvement of a higher spiritual idea. <clears throat> People often ask me why these things they desire are not working, why they're not coming to them. The answer is what you believe. It's your level of understanding. Is You believe that you need God to do something to provide, and he's already provided for you. And that's hard when you're lacking. You think you're lacking. That's hard when you, you're, you're not able to pay your bills. And, and well, part of that is because we've done things we shouldn't have done. Right. You know, we prayed, oh, God, give me a car, give me a car. Then somebody approves you for a loan for 18% interest. And you come to church and said, praise God, God gave me a car. Well, did God give you a car? I don't think so. <laughs> you got yourself in debt. <laughs> <laughs> so the... The answer is what you believe, your level understanding, evolves in your life. It's just a principle. As a man thinketh in his awareness, that's what that means, not heart. Every time you see the word heart, it's your awareness. As a man thinketh in his awareness, so is his realization. And if you think you're no good, that becomes your realization. If you think everybody hates you, that's your realization. No matter how much I try to prove to you I love you, you see me as a person that hates you. So that's your realization. So we want to get the truth inside of us and we want to function. We must make sure our beliefs and our thoughts are perfect in line with the divine of God. We must check them out. <laughs> Sometimes it wouldn't hurt just to write down some things that you've believed all your life and just say, is this true or not true? And most of the time you're going to say not true, not true, not true, not true. Even some people don't believe that God loves them. Can you believe that? I've heard people tell me, God does not love me. And that's heartbreaking. <coughs> I guess I better move that out of the way of my clock so I don't go overboard. <laughs> so in Exodus 2.15, Moses is fleeing to the wilderness. And the wilderness always means a place of being alone. Jesus did not go out into the wilderness in Luke chapter 4. He did later to be taught by the Essenes. I mean, earlier in his life to be taught to the Essenes. He also, I believe, he took Paul out to be taught by the Essenes. But this wilderness here, it's, when you look it up, it means a place of been alone. In other words, getting away from the hindering voices. How many times did Jesus have to lead the crowd? Because there, there were hindering voices. There was two of them the voice of the Pharisees and Sadducees, but then there were the voice of the people saying, Heal me, bless me. In other words, tempting him to be their king. Yeah. That makes sense? Yes. And that's why in Luke chapter 4, he had to settle two questions. Am I who God tells, says I am? And am I here to go to the cross, let him kill me? Or am I here to take over? Well, he wasn't there to take over because he would still be having to heal us and bless us. We'd have to come to Jesus for everything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, so he had to understand that. So... <clears throat> Let me get back to where I'm, I'm jumping ahead. So Horeb, he went to this place called Horeb, and it means solitude. And that's where we have to go. We have to go to solitude. We have to have times and be quiet and meditate and listen to Father. Remember the word, the, 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 be still and know. The, the word still in the Hebrew means quiet and calm. Lily, how many times have we gone to the Lord with, oh my God, you got to do something and pleading and demanding and rebuking the devil and all that stuff we used to do and crying. We all have done that. Mm -hmm. That's not quiet and calm. Yeah. We come to the Father quiet and calm so we can hear Father. We want God to hear us, but we need to hear Father. Right. And so he went to this place uh, within and uh, the flock, if you would, represents a flock of thoughts that we need to bring to Father. And allow Father to see or, or explain our thoughts and free us from our thoughts and really let us know that we exist as Father. We are one with Father and there is no ill judgment that God feels. Of. His judgment is we're righteous, we're pure, and we're holy. So there we are in a training for 40 years. Not physical for us until we arrive at a balanced state of awareness. Uh, it's a time 
when when you when you when you seem to be like father brings you out from something or sometimes it seems to be a wall i found out it's always a step and i found that it's a place of training it's a place to prepare me for something greater and a lot of times we spend a lot of time at that step thinking it's a wall crying and whining and you know wanting to go back to that job that i just lost and all those things not knowing that this is a step to a greater place you know if i would have talked to uh, that where i lost that job mr ballinger if i went back to him and begged him to take me back and he did highly likely i wouldn't be where i'm at today and, and that's true in a lot of areas of our life we have to sometimes realize that father's bringing us up higher same thing with ministry sometimes you have to leave a ministry that's just not going to not going to equip you and they're not going to bring you up remember me telling that story about uh, i heard god saying calling all called out ones in my in a dream i had and i got up and wrote a lot about it but some people are being called completely out of their church because they're going to learn and those people will never receive and there are some people that are called out to learn but to still stay there because they will receive that that's what i learned back then so i think there's a vibratory process that functions in our our body and it includes wisdom and it comes from the heart if you would and that's that bush that burned but it never perished right and it, it's a uh, it, that can be seen as the uh, tissue in our in our nerve systems or whatever almost everything we talk about has a lot to do with our body but it doesn't burn up but it's holy ground and we're we literally today when we're hearing truth we're standing on holy ground if you attend k fairchild's fellowship you're on holy ground if if you listen by way of internet you're on holy ground you're hearing something holy and that we need to embrace that which is holy because we're holy and the two comes together it becomes powerful in our understanding so when man approaches this we must take off uh, from our understanding these thoughts and put off our shoes from our feet and the shoes represent one's walk and one's awareness in their life and that's why he said take off your shoes you're not going to walk that old way anymore and so we have to do that spiritually we got, we got to take it off we got to say you know what father there's still some things that i'm hanging on to i'm still saying but what about but what about but what well, let it all go first of all i can't answer every if i spend all my time answering all your questions about what about we can't go on to perfection you know, I've studied these things for years, have I not, Donna? I mean, probably the, the, almost half of my life now. I think at, at uh, I forget how old I was, but in, in 1988, the Lord brought me out and began to teach me. And I know a lot of stuff. And this is going to sound real arrogant. And my friend Vicki, somebody told her that I was arrogant in the sales field. She said, yes, he is, but he's got the, he's got the knowledge to be arrogant. But I, I know a lot, and I really don't have time for you to call me and try to teach me. <laughs> and that happens all the time. People tell me they want me to help them, but when they get on the phone, they're teaching me everything that they know, and we're wasting time. They will strike you out. <laughs> and, and they get mad at me because I say you're wrong. They say, well, why do you always correct me? Because you're wrong. <laughs> you're just repeating what you've always heard, yes. right? And we don't have time. When Jesus, I was thinking about this the other day, Jesus didn't have people coming up and say, well, the, the only body that did was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The people listened. Amen. And the people's devil was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yes. That's what held the people back. Right. I believe many of them would have gone on to perfection if it wasn't for them. Yes. And that's why God anointed Paul. He was the comforter that Jesus said he would send. Many more comforters. And Paul came to them. And he taught him, and I believe those people function in supernatural power yes. because we never read the book of Acts. Preachers don't even preach out of the book of Acts hardly. But they did some supernatural yes. stuff. Yes. They, lived, they lived out of who they were, yes. right? Yes. So we're on holy ground. And we must put off these shoes of religion, these old worn out shoes of religion, and, and come up higher. So at this inner wisdom, we know, Father... Of fathers you remember the Bible says that Jesus was king of kings well you know what that means that just means he knew more than the other kings did that's all it meant 
And Jesus is father of fathers. We are all fathers. We are fathers of the faith. And we're to bring these to the, 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 the simple-minded and the, the, the children-minded and that come to father, but they need to hear truth and they need more comforter messengers to help, to help them. So what happens in our communion and silence with the light within us, the hindrance of the higher is swallowed up, it swallows up uh, with, with the bright light of truth. And that lower way of thinking, that lower conscience, it just gets swallowed up. We don't have to deal with it. We just say, Father, here I am. You know what's not right in my thoughts. I'm not going to go ask you every one of these questions. Well, is this true? Is the rapture true? Is the devil? I, Father, I'm just saying I'm here and I want the truth, the not concealed word that will make me free from all that and help me experience all that. So while doing some research and meditating on this, something happened to me the other day. And don't ask me what it was. Donna, don't you be asking. It's none of your business. All right. I've got this down. And so. <laughs> but Father spoke to me in my silence right there in that office and gave me an answer to a personal question concerning myself. And the light of truth shines so bright in a writing that I was studying. The answer was in a writing, an old ancient writing that I was studying. And it changed me. And it enabled me to say, okay, Father. And it strengthened me to make that decision in my own personal life. And I'm telling you, it was just like God was sitting right there talking to me and said, this is what you need to do. And I did it. It was just a decision. It was a by faith decision. (laughs) Father, thank you for that. And it's helped me a lot. So I believe in silence. If we be quiet, be calm, and allow Father to speak to us, you can't imagine what you'll hear and the change it'll bring in your life. We see all kinds of possibilities because that land that they were looking for, you know, you can't find the word promised land in, in the Old Testament, but it's, it was a land physically. But see, we worship the land physically. We have made that an idol. And I, oh, we're going to have a, we're, gonna, we're never going to need money anymore. We're, we're gonna, never going to cry anymore. We're, you know, all that stuff we were taught. Everything's going to be wonderful and we won't be sick. Well, we make that an idol. It's not about that. It's about knowing who you are and rising up to that. And that will take care of all that other stuff. So it's a state of understanding. And see, Moses was meek. We feel our inability and we say, who am I? Who, who am I? The same way. But Father sent uh, Aaron to help him. I want to jump ahead just a little bit because I want, to, I want to finish this. I'm getting pretty close, but I'm taking you out to eat today so y'all can wait for a little bit, can't you? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so Jesus experienced this law of the spirit of life, which is, this, again, it's our actual land of living. It's what we live out of. It's in Him we live and we move and we have our being. Father in us as us. And we live out of that. And Romans 7, 12 through 25, and many letters uh, that Paul wrote, they say, since the holy breath of Father is in every part of our being, you are delivered from the do-to-be laws to gain life. Holy breath in you is your true life source, character, and nature. We've got to know that. I don't need to lay hands on you and say you are delivered. I'm saying to you, like Paul says, since the holy breath of Father is in every part of your being, you are delivered from the do to be laws. You don't have to do anything to please God. Amen. Nothing. Hallelujah. <laughs> the only thing you need to do is come to church and make me happy. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Because we always add it, don't we? You don't need to do anything, Lily, but. <laughs> and that's what people did. God loves you, but you need to pay your tithe. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to uh, pray a, a, a salvation prayer. You need to serve in the church. You need to have a ministry. The list goes on and on. You need to quit drinking. You need to quit smoking. Right? Can't eat all that ice cream anymore, Larry. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's so silly. It's, it's, it is funny. It, it, but it's sad. Can you eat frozen custard? <laughs> What'd you say? Can you eat frozen custard? <laughs> frozen custard. Yeah, you can. You can. Good luck with that one. 
All right, so I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. Uh, those that are in my transcript club, you'll get the rest of this. But before we close, I want to read verse 23 one more time and make a couple comments about it, and then I'll close. Paul wrote, verse 23, I must pay close attention, though because there continues to be a part of the Mosaic Law that often hounds me in my conscious awareness, due to my lifetime habit of seeking to follow it, the great lie of believing I had to do the works of the law to be righteous aims to resist the law of the spirit of life in my divine mind, which is my holy breath. If I allow it to lie, I believed for a long, if, excuse me, if I allow it, the lie I believed for a long time seeks to bring me back into its captivity. It makes me feel I must do the law of sacrifice to make me feel better about my side slips. So in scripture, there is a law of first mention. I've learned this a long time ago when I was in Bible school. So if you want to study the word anoint, you need to go to the very first place that it was mentioned, and that was a mention when David was anointed. If you want to study, whatever it is you want to study, go to the first mention and study that and listen to the Father. So the first lie in the Bible is accredited to a symbolic animal called a serpent or a snake. That's the first lie. There was no snake there. There was no apple trees. That's a metaphor. It's, it's, it, and we needed to understand what it meant. We needed ministers that could, I wish I'd had a minister that could explain that to me all my life. Don't you? Yes. The, the truth of it. So anyone with any understanding knows a snake did not talk to Eve. So the Hebrew word that's translated as serpent is nakash, N-A-C-A-S-H. And it means to hiss or whisper. So in your personal life, what hisses and whispers to you? Your thoughts, right? All the time. I wouldn't want you to hear my thoughts. <laughs> I wouldn't want you to know what I think when I walk. You know, I'm not saying I'm impure and everything, but sometimes there's some thoughts that I just, and then I say, that's not me. I rebuke that. You know, sometimes there are thoughts of anger. Sometimes uh, I wish people would get out of my face and go somewhere else, you know. But that, that's our problem is our thoughts. And that was the first race of men. And I had a man get upset with me about that the other day. What do you mean the first race? It was just one. Well, what does it matter? I mean, we don't know. We don't know how long ago God created man. It could have been millions of years ago. We don't know. So Adam represents the first race of man. And so also it means to learn by experience or to observe. So they learn by their own experience. They didn't listen to God. Again, the word obey is shama. It means to listen intelligently, listen attentively. As a, a dog, uh, Carl, you've had a dog before. And you walk and you, you whatever, what was its name? Which one? You remember? Well, any, but what, what would happen when you walk in and said their name? Their ear perked up. That's what the word hearken means. If you, if what we did is we hearkened to the wrong voices. We should have been hearkening to our owner. We should have gone to our owner, our father, our creator. So there are other places in the English word serpent is used. And that's the instances where it's talking about a sea beast. Where it's literal animals, but not here. So in this garden store, it's not a snake. So the metaphor, metaphorical understanding of the word serpent implies the sense consciousness or the desire of an unspiritualized man for sensation. They seek, seek sensation. They seek sense knowledge. They seek sensual knowledge. They seek carnal knowledge. They, they have an appetite for it. When we went to church for years, we were been fed carnal knowledge and we had an appetite for it. We went to the conferences. We went to the revivals for week after week after week, hearing nothing but sense knowledge, trying to please God. So because of that, that serpent sense caused man to fall to a lowly state. And that's what Adam said when he said, I am naked. And again, I mean, I had a lot of conversations this week on Facebook. This one man argued with me and said, no, their sin was they were naked. Well, that don't make sense. <laughs> We're all naked. Just because we got some clothes on, I'm still naked underneath their feet. It wasn't that. They were naked in their understanding. They were void of God's understanding. So by listening to the serpent, we fall to a lowly state. And thus the great lie Paul wrote of was the lie of the Mosaic Law. And then 
it was due to be, due to be, due to be all the time. And if you hear that, then it confirms that lie that you believe. You know, if, if I go to a church and a preacher gets up and preaches against the sin of eating ice cream and says it's a, it is an absolute sin and you shouldn't be doing it. I love ice cream. So what does it do to me? It condemns me. And I say, Father, free me from that. But the truth is, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so why would I free you from that? You know, and I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with doing things that are not fitting of our character. But as far as Father's concerned, they're not separating you from me. You can still fellowship with me. I'm still your Father. And people need to hear that because we cast people out of churches because they're, they're coming out today. That's a big thing in the world today that's going on. And yet the church, now I've heard many churches are, uh, somebody told me about one church that called and repented to a girl that was uh, came out as a lesbian and she left the church and they, the church had a meeting and they invited her back in because they knew they wasn't showing her love. We got to think that what would father do? <laughs> Not what did Jesus do, but what would father do? Father would say all are welcome. I'm the one that changes you to who I want you to be you. by love. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. I feel goosebumps there. Mm -hmm. The sin was self-condemnation. And the church has been a product of producing self-condemnation by reinforcing what we have believed of ourselves all of our life. And so we condemn ourselves. And we're not worthy and we're not holy and on and on and on to the point that many people commit suicide. Yes, do. So in Joshua 15, 7, <laughs> we find a step pass on a road from Jericho to Jerusalem. And this pass was a very dangerous place because there were robbers there. And it was the setting where Jesus taught the parable of the Samaritan. Same setting. And this steep path was called Adumilum, A-D-U-M-M-I-M, -M -M, means a place of the red one, a place of blood, and a red place. What would that make you think of? Blood, blood. Huh? Blood, death. But does it think of the, the red one, the that's place Adam. of blood, huh? Red one is Adam. Adam, that's right. My wife is very intelligent. <laughs> It'd think of blood, too. <laughs> But well, Adam means red one. Red one. Red one, yeah, flush in the face. So right off, you would think of that. Adam means ruddy, R-U-D-D-Y. It means to show the blood. It means flush, to turn rosy and to be red. So the Adam man who believed the lie is a dangerous place to be. Yes, it is. The Bible says death passed on to all men. <coughs> so we think that, you know, it's not our fault. It passed, what it's talking about is the sin consciousness And the lie of penal substitution and all that, that your neck and your void, that passed on. But as Kay Fairchild said not too long ago, we did not have to accept it. Thank you, Lord. And we did because we sat in church. Or we don't even have to sit in church to hear it. It's, it's, it's in the world. Yeah, I'm a sinner. It's in, you know, you got to do this to be successful. And Everything. It's just, it's, Everything. It's so You're a bad employee. Yeah. You list whatever, a bad mother, a bad yeah. whatever. You see stuff on Facebook that proves that people still have, they're self-condemning themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the sin that we have. So we find this place here and uh, we got to understand what went on, went on in this place. So Paul and Jesus knew who they were and they existed as, they knew they exist as a son of God. And they knew that uh, they understood this road of the, of the red ones, if you were. And they were trying to keep people to, from following that road. And that would be the Pharisees and the Sadducees in that day. They, they were carnally mindful teachers. And so this path, it's dangerous. And robbers kill and robbers steal and robbers destroy. So was that a? devil or was that people it was people it was a system so allegorically on this road from jericho this the external consciousness or realm uh, up to jerusalem which would be spiritual it's a dangerous place when you're trying to go to a higher place because there's robbers all around you that would steal from you my uncle was one 
my uncle, and I love him very much, he was Assembly of God pastor, went to Dan Schaefer's church, and he was coming kind of to the end of his life and was old in what he believed. And I met with him one day and was trying to tell him some things that I was learning. This was like 89, 90. And I told him, I said, Uncle Walter, I'm beginning to study the symbolical meanings of the things in the Bible, and it's awesome. And he said, oh, son, that's dangerous. Don't do that. Well, unbeknownst to him, he was the dangerous one. Now, I'm not attacking my uncle. I love my uncle. But what he was telling me, he was the robber. Yes. But I didn't let him rob me. I kept on going. Then I had another time where somebody came to me and said, uh, one of my pastors of 38 years said, uh, you're not called to be a minister. You need to go back and just be in the furniture business. And, you're, you're, you're not. and I looked at him, I said, you didn't call me, Father did. I mean, there was this little intestinal fortitude that was in my life, most of my life. Even as a child, I didn't let people say no. And when Donna tells me I can't do something, you better look out. <laughs> She's always telling me I can't do something, and I do it. <laughs> she thinks you can't return something without a receipt all the time. And I come home with a brand new one. <laughs> it's our constant fight all the time. And she still says it. <laughs> She's a but it's not a rule. <laughs> so, so there is danger around you. And the danger is, is if you obey them, if you agree with them, if you follow them, then that's your thief and it kills, steals, and destroys your intended purpose in your life. Amen. These thieves and robbers, we have to meet our thoughts of error right here too. And they're not just people. They're right. thoughts of error right up here that would turn us aside from the truth and dissipating our life substance. It would it affect our outer body. Mm -hmm. It affects, because what you believe affects you. Yes, it does. When a doctor tells you something, I ha you don't think I had to fight a battle all the time? You know, one, one medical person told me I have three to five years to live. One said five, maybe eight, maybe 10. And, and, and they tell me to look out for these signs all the time. And then these signs, I feel them. And it is scary. There are many times I'm afraid to go to sleep and I have to just sit there and talk to myself and listen to the father and be at peace. Yeah. But I'm not going to accept it because if I did, I just put myself in a rest home. You know, I would just stop, but I'm not going to do that. And I'm just using that as an example because it's in many areas of life. So the law and its teachers come not but to kill, steal and destroy. And Jesus said, I came that they may handle and experience life. He did not say, I came to bring life because we already had life. Mm -hmm. there, everybody still wants to credit Jesus for their life. And family, we've got to quit doing this. I love Jesus. I, I, I love what Jesus did. He, he taught the truth no matter what. He let them beat him. He let them kill him because he believed in what he's doing. And I'm not comparing myself to Jesus, but I'm telling you, I love what I do so much. I let them kill me with words, and they have killed me with words. My brethren, my own brethren have killed me with words. And Kay can say the same thing. But we know this is the truth, and we know this, 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 this people need to handle life. The greatest robber to the race is to deal with this lie. Uh, the greatest robber to the, to the, the race is teaching the lie of sensual understanding and central knowledge and dealing with God on a physical plane. That's right. Amen. On a physical plane. You cannot know God physically. Mm -hmm. How do I know that? The scripture says God seeks. God ascertains, seeks, and desires to know those who ascertains and seeks and desires to know Him in spirit and in truth. And that word truth is the not concealed word. Not in the written Bible. You can't find God in the written word. You can find a version of God, Lily. And we all believe the lie. We believe in a false God most of our life. Am I telling you your experiences weren't real? No, because God met you where you're at. But if you believe, that's what's real, is your experience with God. But also you had some bad experiences with God too because you thought, well, this is why this is happening because I'm not pleasing God or I'm not giving enough money. 
I'm a pastor. I'm telling you, I've had hundreds of people come to me and say, this is why this is happening because I'm not paying my tithe or I'm not serving or I got a divorce. The list can go on and on and on. So the truth is, is we've been looking for Father's love in all the wrong places. It's within. Also, uh, a doom symbolizes a place in man's consciousness where the previous error thought is most likely to enter. And this is the thought that it's, uh, if adequately met, makes the ascent from there. So we realize that these thoughts can enter, but I'm not going to allow it to happen. I'm going to be on alert. And I'll tell you one thing I, I would say. I would be careful what I say amen to all the time. Because it's familiar Right? All the teaching, Larry, that we've had all of our life, it's familiar to us. And so it's almost like it's, we still believe it. And then it comes out of our mouth and it's not true. And that's why, God, guys, your pastor sometimes in the middle of your conversation stops you and says, that's not true. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> because you should get mad at me if I let you keep repeating the lie. Correct? And some people say that's arrogant, and it's not. I do not believe Paul allowed that one bit. So once we've been enlightened, and once we've tasted of that which is heavenly, and lived out of this inward life, and then we go back, we end it back up in the do-to-be laws. And the Bible again says it's impossible to renew that person to come back. So this subtle working of sense awareness hinders the progression of the individual towards spiritual consciousness. You're praying to be more spiritual, you're desiring more spiritual understanding, but then you, you, but you allow this sense awareness to hinder you and you don't know it. And so that's why Paul says, I've got to pay attention to this. I've got to, I've got to be aware every day what's dragging me down. It can be the news, it can be the doctor's report, it could be your relationship with one another, it can be all kinds of stuff. And then when the Father shows it to us, we let it go. By faith, we let it go. So let's be like the Apostle Paul. Pay attention to what we're feeding on. Because what you feed on, you become. Right? Yeah. Christmas and Thanksgiving need to be banned. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I sat there Halloween too. I, I got on the scales this morning and I've gained... And you may think it's nothing, but when you've got a condition like me, you're just not supposed to be gaining weight. But I gained a certain amount of pounds, and I stood there, and I, I actually thought this. How did this happen? <laughs> I actually thought that. How did this happen? Oh, I baked a couple of really good pies. I went to Anna Carl's house New Year's Day, and everybody in the world brought their desserts there. You know, but, but, but you think, how did, this, how did I get this way? Well, we, we allowed things to come in our life, and that's how it gets that way. And it's not to make you feel bad. It's to equip you to know. Amen. So, Father, thank you for the truth. Thank you. I'm going to make better choices. I'm going to think on these things. I'm going to get some of Pastor Roy's books, some of Kay's books. I'm going to study them, and I'm going to read them, and I'm going to let those become the foundation of my life. Feed on the right thing. If When you think you're hungry, go get one of my books. When you want an ice cream cone, go get one of my books. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding you. That's good. So we can do this. We can do this by faith. We, we daily lay our conscious awareness of subconsciousness on the living word. We used to say we lay our head on the chalking block of the word. But we lay our subconscious there because there's things in our subconscious we don't know is there. But we know there's something there because why would I do? Why do I keep doing this? Because there's still some stuff that needs to be, uh, we need to receive with meekness there and that rest, the engrafted word of God. Where does that go? Right into your subconscious and it's able to rescue you, rescue your thoughts. So Paul wrote, if I allow it, the lie, I believe for a long time seeks to bring me back into, into its captivity. In other words, he knew that he was allowing it. It makes me feel I must do the law of sacrifice to make me feel better about my side slips. And it did. It made you feel better. But what are feelings? Mm -hmm. It's your senses, right? Mm -hmm. It made me feel good that I could go give 10% on my money and please God. 
It made me feel good that I, whatever they thought the pastor told me to do, I did it. So I'm okay now. Right? But it didn't help you at all. So let's stay in Eden. I looked this up and I like it. Eden is a place of pleasantness, a productive state of consciousness, believing in all possibilities, which is the consciousness of the divine mind. All errors must be destroyed at our borders. How? I learned this from, from John Cahill years ago, and he used to pray this prayer, but I'm kind of not saying all of it. But Father, put a guard over my eyes, what I see and what I read. Put a guard over my ears, what I hear. Put a guard over my mouth, what I say. And we, I used to pray that every day. And you know what? Father has done that. And what is the guard? It's the truth. When you know the truth, everything you see is beautiful. Every person you see is beautiful. They're lovely and they're holy and they're just as beautiful as you are. Amen? Amen. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. There's a whole lot more to these things. I could write a whole book on each subject, so, but I won't do that. So God bless you. Appreciate you being here. Missed you the last couple of Sundays. And yes, Marcia, we're going to stay in Eden. I love you. Bye-bye.